So I want to tell you about uh, a little bit about my career and my path and how I learned to let go and let others take over. So I've defined my career primarily as a programmer and I've been able to do that in a, a lot of great places over the years. I've been in the uh, uh, educational form at Brown, Cal, and, and Stanford. I've been in small companies and big companies. I've been at NASA, so I've got all the top level domains, the, the edu, the, the, the .gov, and the .com. Uh, and I've had other roles as well. I've been a uh, manager, I've been a teacher, I've been an author, but primarily I define myself as a programmer, but I've learned to adapt and change over time. So what is it that a programmer does? Well, you start off, you get an idea, and then you put together some exact instructions to tell the computer what to do. And when I started out, I wrote them all by hand. Lately, uh, most of it you search for and download off of the web, and then you write the rest to glue together. But the process is, I have to tell the computer exactly what to do. I load that up, you stick it into the computer, and now the software plus the hardware becomes this machine that together can take input and produce the right output to do whatever task you want. And the computer is an amazing changeable machine that you put in different software, it can do different things. But over time, I learned you can only go so far with that. If you, every time you want to change the computer to do something else, you have to write a new program, that can only go so far. And some programs are too hard to write. So how can we change the way we see the world to get farther along? And the answer is to let it go. To say, I don't have to be in charge. I can let the computer do what it has to do. And how do we do that? Well, we replace the handwritten instructions that tell the computer step by step, here's exactly what you're going to do. And instead, we give it a flexible memory and a capability to learn. And, crucially, we give it the ability to observe the world, see, see what's going on in the world, and learn from that, and use those observations to change itself. So it's no longer the programmer who's instituting those changes, it's the computer itself by observing the world. Okay, and how do we get it to do that? Well, it's no longer by programming, it's by what we call machine learning. So the, the computer is learning by observing and coming up with the right answer. And it does that using the scientific method. Now, many of you have enjoyed a uh, chemistry or physics class. Some of you have suffered through a chemistry or a physics class. And a big part of that is doing experiments. And maybe you've done an experiment something like this, where the teacher says, here's some uh, chunks of metal, and some of them are copper, and some of them are lead, and I want you to put them on the balance scale and, and figure out how much they weigh, and then measure their volume, and then plot that on a chart like this. And uh, so are you with me so far? Okay, so far everybody's got to be in, in your class if you've uh, created this uh, chart properly. You're, you're halfway there. Uh, but then the real challenge is, uh, here's this mystery chunk of metal. And the teacher asks, what is that? Is that copper or lead? And the way you can answer that is drawing these lines and saying, oh, it looks like all the lead is on that one line and all the copper is on the other line. And this piece looks like it's pretty close to the copper line, so I'm going to guess that it's copper. Uh, okay, uh, now you got an A minus. You're doing great. Uh, but you can go one step further and say, I'm going to have this decision rule that says uh, if it's below that green line, uh, then we're going to call it copper. And if it's above, then we call it lead. And we can write down that rule in this form, saying we've invented this new concept that's called density which is the ratio of the mass to the volume, and if the density is above that threshold, then it's lead, otherwise it's copper. Okay, now you got an A in, in your class, you're doing great. And, uh, and notice what you've done here. You've observed the world, you've formed a theory, 
And part of that theory is introducing something that wasn't there before. Uh, this notion of density, which was not part of the input, it's not part of the output, but it's an intermediate form. And essentially, everything we do in machine learning is just uh, a version of that, only more complicated. Because in that uh, example, we had uh, 30 examples, 30 chunks of metal that we plotted, three variables, the volume, the mass, and whether it was copper or lead. And the lines that we used to separate one uh, decision from another were all straight lines. Uh, so that's about the simplest form you can have. And when we get to real machine learning problems, it's more like millions or sometimes billions of examples and of variables. And the lines that uh, separate them are very jagged. Uh, now, I can't really show you a picture of millions of variables. I can only plot uh, two-dimensional form. Uh, so you'll just have to imagine that it gets more complicated. But everything comes from the same idea. You observe the world, you form these theories, and you make predictions. And what can you do with that? Well, you can do things like uh, play chess. We show it examples of, uh, of chess positions and, and who wins and loses. And the system can learn to make the move that wins rather than the move that loses and do that better than any human has ever done. Uh, similarly, do the same kind of thing for playing the game Go and even for playing games like StarCraft, uh, which are much more complex, many more actions, we can still learn to do that and beat a champion player just by observing the world and forming these theories. We can learn to identify objects that are in pictures. So we create a database of millions of pictures with the labels for what they are, and the computer learns that mapping from pictures to examples. You show it a picture it's never seen before, and it can come up with the right answer. Uh, how many of these people do you recognize? Uh, well, the answer should be none, uh, because none of these are real people. All of these are people that were generated by a computer by having it uh, look at examples of pe people, learn what uh, people in general look like, and then asking it to generate a new person that's never been seen before. And we can do that, and we can do it in a convincing fashion. Uh, we can apply this, this type of uh, computer vision technology to uh, medical analysis. And so here, we're looking at a picture of an eyeball trying to uh, diagnose this for disease. Turns out this is a healthy one. And we can do that just right. Uh, and we can do that better than expert doctors do. And we can also learn more. Right? So uh, we took these images and we had the task of figuring out, uh, do you have diabetic retinopathy or not? And we said, yeah, we can predict that pretty well. But when you put together a bunch of computer nerds and a bunch of doctors, uh, they don't want to just stop there. So they said, okay, well, we've got this database and it's got multiple columns in it besides just sick or healthy. Uh, so could we predict the blood pressure of the patient just by looking at their eyeballs? And the answer was yes, you can do that as well. And so this is an, another uh, path towards figuring out the, the blood pressure and, and making predictions based on that. Uh, and then uh, one of the computer nerds says, oh, well, in the database, there's this other column of uh, sex. Can we predict that? And the doctor says, oh, you silly computer scientist. Uh, you can't do that. There's no difference between uh, a male eyeball and a female eyeball. And the computer scientist said, well, if that's so, then uh, how come we predicted most of them correctly? Uh, and the answer is nobody quite knows yet. Uh, we're trying to figure out why it can make that prediction. Uh, we see that there's a, a little bit of a difference in the way the optic nerve is connected to the back of the eye in the, in the uh, construction of, of uh, the head and the eyeball socket and so on. And there's also something going on around the periphery of the eye that we don't quite understand yet. So this computer technology is leading the doctors to rethink what they know because it can make predictions that they can't. Uh, another example is we can start observing the world around us as we're driving and learn to make a self-driving car that can drive with, without accidents. We can take uh, text in one language, 
translate it into another language. This is something that we can't quite yet do at the level of expert translators. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we can do 100 different languages in and translate into any of 100 different languages out, and not too many experts cover that many languages. Uh, we can combine the computer vision with the translation. So you can point your phone at a, at a sign. It can recognize the words in that sign and then regenerate a picture uh, that uses the right font and color but translates it into your native language. And we can learn uh, to generate captions for pictures. So before I, l I showed you uh, learning objects, Show me a picture of a hummingbird, I'll tell you it's a hummingbird. Now we can say, let's gather all the pictures on the internet that have captions on them and learn a mapping from pictures to captions. And so here's a picture it's never seen before and it comes up with a caption, a road leading into the mountains. Uh, so that's pretty good. And, and it's, it's understanding what's going on and it's understanding enough about English to have a grammatical correct and relevant sentence. So that's a, a nice combination of two different modalities. And so far, all the examples I've shown you have been successes. They've been uh, mostly at or above uh, human expert level, a few a little bit below. Uh, but I don't want to give you the impression that this technology is perfect. So let me show you some of the outtakes uh, from this program. Uh, we gave it this picture. Uh, it had never seen a picture like th quite like this before. And the caption was, a couple of giraffes standing next to each other. So that's not right, uh, but it doesn't have much experience with the horses in purple pajamas. Uh, but maybe it saw the pattern on the pajama and says, that looks a little bit like the spots on a giraffe. And I think it threw in the couple of, uh, because in some way the system says, this doesn't really match a single giraffe. Uh, maybe it's two giraffes that are confusing me. Here's another one. It's a great picture. And the caption is a man riding a skateboard. And I don't know how well it shows up on the projector, uh, but there are uh, horizontal lines in the floorboards there that maybe look a little bit like the deck of a skateboard. Uh, there certainly are no wheels. Uh, but the computer decided here that nobody, not even the king, uh, would be in that pose unless they were off balance on a skateboard. OK, so we're not perfect yet but uh, a tantalizing view of uh, amazing capabilities. Now, so I talked about uh, the task of a traditional programmer. This is a famous pi picture. This is Margaret Hamilton here, who was uh, the lead programmer for the Apollo project in the early days, and it just worked out. Uh, she happened to be my boss in my first job out of college, so I got a chance to know her. The role of a traditional programmer, as we said, was to tell the computer exactly what to do, step by step. If this, then that. And you can see uh, the instructions that she's come up with here are quite detailed. There's a lot of situations and a lot of commands for exactly what to do. And so that means what a traditional programmer is doing is being a micromanager. And nobody likes a micromanager. You do not want Darth to be your boss. You make one little mistake with your star cruiser and uh, he's uh, uh, on top of you. Uh, that's not the way to go, right? If you want success, you don't want to micromanage. You want to give uh, some freedom to do the right thing. So if it's not a micromanager, what is the right metaphor? for how we should get computers to succeed. Is it a teacher? Well, that makes sense because we're showing them lots of examples. Is it a leader? Uh, well, that kind of makes sense too. And here's General Patton saying, don't tell people how to do things, which is what a traditional programmer does. Tell them what to do, which is what we do with a machine learning system, and let them surprise you with the results. Uh, and I think this is an appropriate quote because General Patton's dealing with the fog of war, with uncertainty. And that's exactly what the problem is in artificial intelligence, that we've gone from the kind of traditional programming tasks we do, balancing a spreadsheet, which are certain, to the uncertain tasks, like driving a car on a street where who knows what's uh, going to happen next. And when you're dealing with uncertainty, the more you have to be able to react 
rather than pre-programmed in ahead of time. So maybe a leader like General Patton is the right metaphor, or maybe a philosopher. And so I'm going to go to two of my favorite philosophers. And uh, Mick on the right here is famous for saying uh, his quote about what it is that we want to do. But I think Mick has got it wrong. And I think uh, Bobby on the left there really has the right direction. Because these are the things that we need in life. But we've built a system where we allow ourselves to say what we want. And sometimes uh, the way we click and use our votes, uh, we're maybe going in the wrong direction. And so I could waste hours playing some silly game or reading some gossip that's not important. And at the end, I say, oh, man, I wish I had those hours back. Uh, but it's too late. Obviously, it's too late for me. But what's worse is it's too late for all my friends as well. Because we built this marketplace of ideas and clicks where if I'm clicking on something, then that serves as a recommendation. And so you're more likely to get it. And then uh, you click on it. And that's a recommendation for your friends and it spreads like a virus. We built our system in such a way that we don't necessarily encourage the things that we really need. We encourage the short-term clicks for things that we want in the short term. And if we're going to build our systems in terms of trying to optimize and head for the things we need, we have to do a better job as a society, as philosophers and ethicists, of figuring out what is it as a society that we're aiming for. And then we can use machine learning to get our computers to get there. Thank you.